kind of a challenge I would have to anybody who watches the Is Genesis History movie. When one side presents their argument, it sounds compelling mm -hmm. until somebody comes and cross-examines them. Hello everyone, welcome back to Is Genesis History Science? In this episode, Del Tackett is joined by Danny Faulkner, PhD. Let's see what they have to say, shall we? It was a beautiful night. Danny took me far outside the city and kept me up very late in order to show me something I will never forget. Is it just me or did that sound a little creepy? Oh my goodness, now you're going to make me buy a telescope. You know, we have some purposes given for the stars. In Genesis 1, 14 to 19, that's the day 4 creation account, it mentions the stars and other heavenly bodies to mark time, to rule over the night, to be for signs, seasons, and festivals, and so forth. Well, it looks like Danny's starting out a little early this episode. He's already using the Bible, specifically Genesis, as the authority, when as you all recall, the purpose of the original movie was to demonstrate the veracity of the Bible, and Genesis specifically. People have been using the stars for marking the passage of time. These patterns repeat every night, they repeat every year, they come back in their seasons. There's a lot of regularity going on. What about the design of the sun and the moon? I heard you sneak the word design in there, Dell. Well, a couple things I can talk about. On rare occasions, the moon passes between us and the sun. Not very often. And when that happens, the moon just barely covers the sun up. If the moon were a little smaller or a little farther away, it wouldn't do it at all. If it were larger or closer to us, it would be grossly over total. And, uh, so these eclipses are spectacular and rare, and this is the only planet on which it matters. And it's the only planet on which it happens. Okay, so the argument you're making here is, if things were different, things would be different. And let me guess, you're going to pull some deep meaning from that. And you've got to either think that that's just the way the world is, for no apparent reason, or the world is that way for a purpose and design. And to me, that speaks of creation. Did I call it? Okay. High overhead here, we have the great square of Pegasus, this big rectangle. Now, coming off of Pegasus is this little fuzzy spot there. You see that? That's the Andromeda Galaxy. That is the most distant object that you can see with the naked eye. It's a little over two million light years away, and contains a couple hundred billion stars. Oh, I know where this is going. Two million light years away, we can see it, speed of light is a constant, that means the universe can be no younger than two million years. This is going to be great, we're going to get an explanation for this. Can't wait. Okay, Danny, that brings me to a big question. A big question in a lot of people's minds. If we have stars that are that far away, millions of light years away, and if the Earth is young, as we believe, then how in the world can the starlight even be here? Here it comes. We're finally going to get an answer. We call this the light travel time problem. And I'll try to phrase it for you a little differently. We believe that the creation is only thousands of years old. Oh, say 6,000 years, or 7,000, or something like that. And I just pointed out something that we think is 2 million light years from us. I think those distances are reasonably correct. And we creationists need to answer this question, and we've offered several different solutions to that. I'll discuss with you my solution. Okay. Here it comes. 
several things jump out at me in the creation account. One, there was a lot of process going on. Very rapid process, but still process. If you look at the Day 3 account, it talks about plants rising up out of the ground. It says, let the earth bring forth these plants, and the earth brought forth. I think if you had been there, it would have looked like a time-lapse movie. Growth that might normally take decades, taking place in a matter of minutes or hours at most. Normal growth, abnormally fast. I believe you can interpret one day of creation in terms of another day. So I turn to the Day 4 account. Not much information is given there, but I think God rapidly made the stars and other astronomical bodies, and then, in order for them to fulfill their function, to be seen, he had to rapidly bring forth that light. Just as he brought plants and had them mature quickly, he had to bring that light here. Wait, what now? That's your answer? God brought the light? Why didn't you just say magic? That's a dumb answer, and here's why it's dumb. Let's say your god created stars all zippity-quick, and those stars started creating light. So your god snatched up that instant of light and brought it here. Has it occurred to you that we would only see that one instant of light? The next instant of light would still be two million years away from us, with nothing but darkness in between. Your god would have to shuttle back and forth for two million years, bringing light, until the natural flow of light reached us. That's significantly longer than would be possible in your 6,000 year old universe. I'm suggesting that when we actually look at these objects like the Andromeda Galaxy we saw a few minutes ago, we're looking at light that actually left that object. Yes? So I think there's a rapid maturing took place. Rapid maturing? What's that got to do with your god bringing the light? Danny, are there some other things that you see that would point to a young universe? I think so. For instance, spiral galaxies. The Andromeda galaxy we talked about is a spiral galaxy. Our own is... And inside of the galaxy should spin faster than the outside of the galaxy. So after a few rotations, you'd wind up or smear out those spiral patterns. They ought to disappear after a few rotations. Now most astronomers think that galaxies are 10 billion years old. So, why do we still see spiral patterns? You shouldn't see those. And it's been long recognized as a problem. I see Danny is thinking that the arms of spiral galaxies are trailing out from the center, just as the swirling spiral atop a recently stirred coffee. That's not the case. Spiral arms are density waves, which travel through the galaxy's disk, causing a piling up of stars and gas at the crests of each wave. Do we have any indication that this explanation is correct? Oddly enough, we do. Spiral Galaxy NGC 4622 tends to indicate just that. In 2002, a Hubble Space Telescope image suggested that the outer spiral arms of the galaxy NGC 4622 pointed in the same direction as the galaxy's rotation, unlike any previously known galaxy. This could not be the case if Danny's coffee swirl understanding of galaxies were correct. Also, if we look at the outer planets of the solar system, the gas giants, they all have rings. We also know that these rings are changing. They're wiping out. They've actually documented changes that have taken place in the ring systems. You have all these gravitational tugs from the other satellites orbiting around, so these ring systems are fairly young. That doesn't prove the solar system is young, but it proves that these ring systems are young. And that's Interesting. That entire last paragraph from Danny Boy can be safely ignored. He freely admits that the age of the rings has precisely dick to do with the age of the solar system, and hence the universe. We've mentioned a lot of theories about spirals and so forth, and that brings us to what most people consider the big theory concerning cosmology and the universe, and that's the Big Bang. 
How do you see that? Is it holding up over time? Well, I don't think so. I think it's getting some problems. So much so that more than a dozen years ago, I think the New Scientist magazine, there was an open letter protesting the Big Bang Theory. And it's had hundreds of signatories since. And most of the people signing it are atheists. What difference would atheism make? Science is utterly unconcerned with the supernatural. So a person's religious affiliation, or lack thereof, doesn't come into it. So this idea that the Big Bang Theory is universally accepted is not true. There are many people out there. Who? Well-known people. Who? Very famous physics and astronomy people. Who? That have real problems with the Big Bang. Indeed. The universe may have existed forever, according to a model that applies quantum correction terms to complement Einstein's theory of general relativity. The model may also account for dark matter and dark energy, resolving multiple problems at once. This, however, does nothing to accomplish the stated goal of the Is Genesis History movie. The goal is not to disprove the Big Bang, but to demonstrate that Genesis is history. No evidence has been presented so far in this episode that supports the Genesis fable. And I don't see any way that you can reconcile the Big Bang with the Bible. Though a lot of people seem to think you can. Why should anything need to be reconciled with the Bible? Or Harry Potter, for that matter? I think the temptation they have there is to try to interpret scripture in terms of current cosmological thinking. That's nothing new. It's happened before. This turned out with disastrous results. So I think that when you look at the history of science, the way we've discarded theories over time, We've had theories that supposedly were beyond dispute, and then later on discarded. When you see that lesson from history, and then you want to wedge Genesis, you want to interpret Genesis in terms of the ruling paradigm, I think you need to be very careful. That's how science works. When new information becomes available, existing theories may need to be updated or discarded. That's how science continually improves. And why are you talking about interpreting scripture? You're supposed to be demonstrating that Genesis is history. I realized that Danny was reorienting our perspective. We need to interpret the universe in terms of Genesis, not the other way around. And Genesis tells us that God created the sun, moon, and stars to be a magnificent clock to track the passage of time. Even the ancients built temples to follow the stars. Well, there's the wrap-up. Nowhere in this episode was there even the slightest shred of evidence that Genesis is, in fact, history. All we've gotten is assertions of biblical authority like we just heard from Dell. Anyway, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't already, Please remember to subscribe to both Paulagia's channel and to this one so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time.